much for inviting me. It was extremely exciting and inspiring event. And um, I have to admit, it was more exciting and inspiring than most of uh, sessions in the New Reaps conference, honestly. <laughs> Just don't tell them. <laughs> uh, so thank you for great introduction. Uh, I'll try to uh, fit all the 53 slides into 30 minutes. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, but indeed, uh, the number of things we are working on in this uh, lab called Canada Excellence Research Chair in Autonomous AI is quite, um, quite wide. I mean, we have like more than 40 students, postdocs, interns, and collaborators, and uh, it's been kind of um, a really hectic four years. But um, I think AI is going through a really a revolutionary phase, and uh, we better ride this wave. So um, maybe not everyone agrees in AI field, uh, but majority would probably say that uh, whenever AGI or artificial general intelligence is mentioned, people would agree that for decades, that's what people in the field did consider as a holy grail, as an ultimate goal of what they would like to build. Uh, the problem was, of course, people never agree on definitions. I mean, that's how people work. Um, so AGI means different things for, to different people, and some necessarily talk about consciousness, and other uh, talk about uh, I don't know, AGI developing uh, certain uh, personality traits, which actually can be measured, depends on definitions, so on and so forth. But for now, just to be more technical, uh, what I mean by artificial general intelligence, just to start with some based uh, approach, is essentially an artificial intelligence system that uh, learned how to generalize at really uh, sufficiently large scale to problems and tasks way out of uh, distribution, quote unquote. So basically, it's really highly gener generalist agent, similar to human in that way, uh, that may not necessarily be uh, beating human champion and go or chess, but it can be like human, able to learn chess, learn go, learn to play violin, and keep going, and just go buy groceries and do whatever stuff. So it's generalist in a sense of multitask system. Of course, I'm also following the open AI definition, which is not technical, but I think gets the gist of it. It's system that should be autonomous, uh, multitask, and the tasks better be useful, so like all economically valuable work. And in a sense, if you look at the history of um, not just artificial intelligence and machine learning, but you go back to statistics in uh, last century, what was always the main goal of like statistics and learning from data, which is a basis of modern AI, it always has been generalization. It's just the classical statistics would like to uh, fit the curve and extrapolate it to the next point that has not been observed so far, assuming data come from same distribution. Uh, machine learning goes further and the data sets become very complex and multivariate and you need methods that can do this type of generalization um, kind of uh, further and further away. More recently, just before the advent of large-scale models, the out-of-distribution generalization became extremely hot area of research, and uh, our lab spent several years as well exploring how do you uh, how do you train neural networks not to latch on to some um, uh, kind of spuriously correlated features, but to truly learn invariant properties of the data. And the classical picture I was showing there of cows on different background were used in many, many, many papers on out of distribution. And the story goes that if you train neural net uh, to detect, uh, basically to discriminate between types of animals, and it does awesome job, uh, once you move to, say, unusual background, like cows on the beach instead of cows on the green grass, the system completely misclassifies uh, the animal because it didn't really learn the properties of animal. It did learn just properties of background that was easier. So uh, deep neural networks always uh, kind of had this tendency like lazy students studying to the test. 
So they wouldn't really learn the invariant properties, but they really tried to find a shortcut. And the whole field was trying to figure out what to do with them so they will not be learning shortcuts. Many algorithms were proposed and approaches, and we worked like on things on top of invariant risk minimization. I will actually mention it later in the talk. So on and so forth. So lots of effort, the whole exciting field. And uh, in a few slides, I say what happened recently with out of distribution generalization and large scale models. It's kind of solved it. Then there was a whole field of adversarial robustness. I mean, it still remains a similar problem. Uh, just the changes in the distribution are not statistical, but this, well, I mean, they are kind of statistical, but they designed it a way to kind of uh, confuse the system on purpose. Like you show pictures of animals and then you throw a little bit of a noise that uh, human eye will not detect, but system uh, will misclassify that cat as something totally different. And the question was, how do you build systems that are robust to this type of adversarial attacks? Again, robustness, in a sense, is improved by uh, scaling the systems. And today, I will be mainly talking about the scale revolution, as my talk title suggests, and what it implies. So on and so forth. There are so many fields in machine learning, and most of them, our lab was kind of involved in researching, including transfer learning, meta learning, and particularly continual learning. Um, the process of kind of acquiring knowledge without forgetting what you learned before, it's all relies on the generalization. So, yeah, as I said, continual learning specifically is the most realistic, most practical uh, way of um, approaching uh, building AI systems that will be truly multi-task generalist agents. So ultimately, at very high level, I'm not going to go into any details of any papers. I'm happy to discuss it uh, after the talk, or you can look at the, uh, my website. But the idea of continual learning ultimately is, by analogy with human brain that kind of developed over um, millions of years of evolution, it developed different kind of uh, parts and areas which have different function. And together, you recombine this function and uh, you get the generalist agent that can pretty much tackle any task that will be thrown its way or his or her way. So similarly, can we maybe uh, uh, develop neural networks um, as uh, generalist agents that will combine a certain number of principal components of this world? Of course, simple analogy, you start with uh, linear spaces and you say, what if I just keep kind of sampling data from this humongous but hopefully finite dimensional linear space and then I keep uh, getting my principal components. Hopefully this world can be accurately approximated with some finite number of those things. And if I get them all, that's where AGI happens because now I can recombine things and do more or less well pretty much anything that's required in this world. It's just an analogy and just the gist of it. Of course, you're not working anymore in linear spaces. You might be working in functional spaces, so it's a functional basis and you need to recombine those things. Or even more, it's procedures. So you learn procedures that are elementary, but recombination of those will hopefully give you generalization to uh, never seen before type of tasks that you want your uh, agent to do. So all this kind of, um, attempts uh, to build better agency is, is, again, as I said, they're all based on uh, the notion of generalization and how to generalize it further. And then, as we all know, recently, starting in 2020 when GPT-3 was released, uh, people started observing that one after another, all these problems in machine learning were, if not solved, but greatly, greatly advanced just by the fact that the models uh, that people started building were orders of magnitude larger than anything they did before. And this plot essentially just showing the amount of compute uh, used to build like state-of-art systems and there is a clear change in uh, what's happening in the past few years just in terms of the trend and the amount of compute required to build state-of-art systems. So you see what's happening there, right? So we're all kind of living through that revolutionary uh, kind of epoch when uh, humongous increase in amount of compute thrown on AI and amount of data thrown on AI combined with our ability to scale the models to absorb this information started giving us performance that we never were able to obtain before. So 
many people say that essentially the revolution is caused by the advent of so-called foundation models. A little bit of history uh, and where the term came from and why they're called foundation models. Uh, basically, 2020, GPT-3 comes out um, and starts doing things that GPT-2 or any predecessors just couldn't possibly do. At the same time, I will talk about that in a second, uh, scaling laws papers come out kind of explaining what's going on and why increasing scale increases performance in certain ways. And then um, many systems released after that, including, again, OpenAI's Clip, DALI, and so on and so forth. And then a paper from Stanford uh, led by Purcell Young and his colleagues comes out in August 2021, uh, basically quoting the term foundation models. Models that are trained on uh, incredibly large unprecedentedly large amounts of data that models were not usually trained before. Uh, assuming the data are not just large, but of course diverse, because it's not the size of the data, it's the amount of information what you're actually trying to uh, get to. Uh, and then, uh, without any particular new breakthroughs in architecture, using generic transformer architectures, but scaling them by orders of magnitude, you are able to absorb uh, by the model capacity all this new huge amount of information in unsupervised way. You simply train models to learn the distribution of how the world is. You're not training them for any specific task to do. They are not uh, specialists. They're generalists. So they just kind of learn about how things are. And if you want them to do something later on, you just give them a few shots, few examples, uh, fine tune them a little bit, and they get it. So that's why they were called foundation models. In a sense, they are basis of foundation for building on top of them uh, all kind of applications and specific kind of um, um, models for specific tasks. And just as foundation or foundations, they are not yet buildings. You cannot just use them as is. You need to do stuff on top of them, whether it's for performance or whether it's for improving other behaviors. That's where alignment came in picture. You need to maybe add some feedback from kind of human preferences to make them, oops. Anyway, um, so it was extremely exciting. And uh, again, a little bit of history besides uh, kind of the technical part, uh, there was a huge excitement among a relatively small number of uh, students also at Mila where I teach and we started organizing scaling workshops and trying to learn more about that stuff and that's essentially how our group uh, starting from like 2020, 2021 got into foundation models and scaling laws, which I'll talk about that in a minute. Of course, everybody has uh, seen many, many, many beautiful slides today, and I don't go, I don't have to repeat those about what kind of systems people built since then, since 2020, and uh, it's just really whatever Cambrian explosion or um, I don't know. Uh, faster than exponential growth in the number of new large-scale models that are being built and they becoming more and more powerful and they cover different modalities. It's not just language models anymore, of course. There are uh, generative images, video, Sora, audio, music generation, you name it. And the interesting thing, as I mentioned, is that if you go back to GPT-3, what made a huge difference in performance? GPT-3, just like GPT-2 and uh, previous kind of transformer-based models, is nothing but an autoregressive model that tries to predict next token given the history window of previous tokens. And uh, essentially, it just stayed the same. Architecture was pretty much the same. The only thing that changed was the orders of magnitude uh, larger scale of the model. That's all. So that was quite a revelation. But in a sense, it was just kind of supporting the intuitions that people had before. And I always like to quote uh, the bitter lesson. It's one of my, well, and many other people, favorite short blog posts by Rich Sutton, who essentially said that, uh, yeah, the largest lesson that can be read from 70 years of AI research is that general method, methods that leverage uh, computation and are ultimately the most effective and by large margin. So a bitter lesson, why is it bitter? I'll talk to th through that, is that AI researchers 
and perhaps not just AI researchers, love complexity. They love sophisticated algorithms. And uh, that's what reviewers at uh, top AI conferences also kind of favor. But the bottom line could be you can go very sophisticated and you get your paper accepted this year and nobody going to use your method 10 years, 10 years later. So if you really want to achieve some kind of, a, um, I don't know, a long term effect, lo long term impact, uh, then maybe you should rethink what you focus on when you are working on your algorithms and models. And there are many examples, again, just that quoting uh, that bitter lesson. I mean, you can start from uh, rule-based systems that people spend years on developing, only later to be completely washed out by uh, automated machine learning that would learn those rules. And then in machine learning, people were coming up with all kinds of features for language, for speech, for images, for decades, later on, deep learning comes, learns all these representations automatically, so on and so forth. And then you have essentially various ontologies and rules how to play chess. Later on, essentially, you have a massive, computationally expensive, but at that time, compute is cheaper and cheaper search, and that really helps. And you have self play and go, and so on and so forth. So, essentially, why is it important? It is because you need to decide where to invest your time and efforts and the time and efforts of your students. So you should be careful about what you focus on because if you want to stand the test of time, then maybe you should check how your methods gonna scale. And if they're overly complicated and not gonna scale, then maybe you shouldn't be working on them. Again, what I'm saying is usually not taken lightly, but by majority of the field, as you can imagine. But the bitter lesson the final thing, it's not about, no, we should throw away all the human knowledge and so on. It basically says that maybe we shouldn't try to incorporate into AI the final results of our knowledge, say, particular uh, ways that brain is, say, structured, like convolutional networks. Maybe we should incorporate a higher level ideas or inductive biases about how to reach that state. So basically, what's the constraints on evolution uh, that provide us with best networks possible rather than trying to uh, kind of tinker and create those networks uh, exactly the way the, the brain works, for example. So that's a higher level notion of inductive biases. Yeah, but again, with many people in the field, if you mention that maybe we don't need inductive biases and scale is all you need, um, yeah, you're gonna have a very heated argument. But, uh, that's what we recently uh, observing. That's what people were saying. There is no way you can't. No, it w it won't happening. It's stupid. And yeah, the bitter lesson in action. Okay, so I don't know how much time I actually have left. Well, I still have some time. Uh, so I kind of wanted to switch gears a little bit and um, now talk a little bit about. Okay, that's all wonderful. So we have large scale systems popping up like every day. And uh, the question is, what can we say about their behaviors at scale? Uh, are there any ways of predicting how well they're going to scale? Will they improve? What do we need to do to have such predictions? It's a whole field of research. And that's kind of the field our lab entered, as I said, early on, back in like 2021. And uh, yeah, I was telling some stories about uh, how a bit controversial uh, that field was back then, but luckily not anymore. Uh, the field didn't change, it's just the people perception of it did, as usual. <laughs> so, why scaling laws? Well, even if you don't get into philosophical or whatever arguments about is scale all you need, are we building AGI, if, even if you just leave it all aside, and you look at all the machine learning papers when people compare different algorithms, different models, uh, develop something new and claim mine is better than yours. Well, typical machine learning paper, right? How do they compare things? They usually compare things in tables. Here is a benchmark data set. Here is a whatever uh, benchmark environment for reinforcement learning. Let's try our methods. Let's see what happens. Ours is better, paper published. Instead, maybe they all should just adopt a different methodology and compare how these methods will compare when you get more data, 
when you have more compute, because eventually compute will get cheaper, and you can build larger models. What will happen? And then you can see that situation may reverse on s relatively smaller data sets. You may have convolutional networks, as expected, being the king of the world for images, and outperforming vision transformers, and people who love inductive biases, of course would say because convolutional networks are based on brain, they have inductive biases, how vision works, of course that's important, they work better, yeah, when you have less data. If you have a lot of data, then it's like a Bayesian rule in action. If you don't have much data, you need a good prior inductive bias. And when you have close to infinite data, the prior will be washed out by the data. And hopefully your prior was not too wrong, because if prior is really wrong, it will be taking more data to wash it out. So maybe you should have more generic architecture like vision transformers without too many inductive biases and let it learn from more data, and then it will outperform your inductive biases based convolutional network. Bitter lesson. <laughs> Okay, it's, by the way, not the first time that thing was observed. This is 1994, New Reap's paper from kind of uh, famous people in machine learning, but maybe not in deep learning, like Karina Cortes and Vladimir Wapnik, the names that you might not hear that frequently anymore, but um, before the deep learning kind of um, hype started. But they were making the same point in that paper, although everything was at much smaller scale, the same argument that we should study and compare models and algorithms at scale so we can see how the situation may revert. And there is this actually whole history of scaling loss which goes way before 2020. So Karina Cortes and co-authors papers from 1994 did observe that, in fact, there is a power law our scaling law that looks like straight line when you take log log plot, which predicts how the neural nets, well, smaller nets, in that case it was nothing like the compute of today, but they already saw that this power laws may be a good functional form to describe how things are gonna improve. So basically, uh, the loss will go straight down in log log plot according to power law. Then more work came on top of that, uh, jumping to 2017. Joel Hasnes was at Baidu, now he is our collaborator at Cerebras, and he did the similar kind of type of analysis, but on much wider multi uh, kind of uh, orders of magnitude scale of data and some other things, and the work by Jonathan Rosenfeld from MIT came out, uh, showing that similar power laws also apply when the x-axis is not data, but rather model size. Then finally, Jared Kaplan and collaborators from OpenAI and uh, John Hopkins and others, they had this famous paper that started the whole scale is all you need, well, I would say religion in AI. Um, yeah, essentially, he showed that yes, both scaling laws with respect to data, with respect to model size, and also with respect to compute hold. And the famous three scaling plots essentially say if you fix the entity, uh, the quantity on the X, say compute or data or model size, and you let the other two kind of roam free so you can choose the best, uh, the improvement in the test loss the, will be going down according to this power law. So the god of the straight lines is here. Now zoomed in. <laughs> Okay, uh, probably many of you have seen that paper, but if not, I'd be happy to talk about it. But anyways, so that kind of started the uh, mental revolution in many people's minds, although it's surprising how many years actually it took before uh, the field started actually understanding that this is extremely important. And the reason it's important is that not only it allows you to predict how your particular system you're building gonna improve. Say, they were building GPT-3 and there are many engineering so solutions to compare. So it gives you this investment tool to build it faster, uh, even if you open AI and have lots of compute, uh, there are many ways to waste it, so you don't want to waste it, so you compare things, see what scales better, and proceed with that. So it's extremely useful tool, and it also kind of gives you an idea like how much it's gonna improve if you would provide extra compute and extra data. And by the way, there is nothing specific to transformers. 
with scaling laws. Many other architectures are kind of scaling well. This is multi-layer perceptron. Uh, this was another bitter lesson to uh, people who really love inductive biases. They don't like to see this picture. This multi-layer perceptron, and it does scale, maybe not as efficiently as transformer, but with sufficient compute uh, data, if compute becomes cheap, uh, scaling multi-layer perceptrons may be not completely out of questions, at least for some tasks. Okay, changing gears a bit. So this was mainly the era of straight lines on the log scale plots. And then people started also noticing that it's not always straight and things get interesting if you measure not only loss, but also performance on tasks of interest. So one picture on the um, uh, right was from original GPT-3 paper from whatever, May, June 2020, where it was a downstream task. Okay, so here's GPT-3, can it actually do arithmetic? It turned out on x-axis you have model size. For a while it couldn't, and when it got large enough, it started kind of grasping or grokking uh, simpler addition with like uh, two uh, arguments, then three, then four. And uh, the more difficult the addition or subtraction task was, the larger the model needed to be. Then people realized also that there is an effect of grokking or the rapid transition from really bad to really good performance. And it may happen uh, with increase of the compute, you just like keep things running and suddenly it grows. Then people also had this paper on emergent properties in language models. So all these kind of transitions and emergent properties at scale, um, that was very interesting. Like how do you explain it? Can you predict it? Can you have functional form that goes beyond the straight lines that can capture that? This particularly was a grokking case, so we looked into kind of internals of the training process and first of all try to see how maybe the moment of grokking depends on the amount of data, try to come up with an empirical distribution of that. But even more interestingly, uh, it's purely empirical and it's kind of work in progress, just a workshop paper at this point, uh, we're working on that further, was that by analogy with physical systems and biological systems where before the phase transitions, sometimes you see high uh, variance in the quantity of interest or like in epilepsy, you see high frequency oscillations before the event happens and so on and so forth. We started looking for spectral kind of properties of the training and test loss and we realized that all the runs where we would experience grokking or where the model will eventually get to the um, perfect accuracy on, that was an arithmetic task, uh, it was always associated with high frequency oscillations in both training and test loss, while non-groking situations were not associated with such a fluctuation. So you could use this as um, a tool to see if this run is promising or not, if it's not going to grok, maybe just let's kill it and restart from scratch. There are many things, I mean, it's just scratching the surface. There are many interesting things you can discover when you look into the dynamics of training and its properties and measure various patterns. And you can try to predict how that system uh, will perform at scale. Finally, uh, as I said, uh, scaling laws in form of power laws were not anymore capturing everything. So you see inflection points, you see those transitions, you see sometimes non-monotonic behavior, double descent, and all kind of interesting stuff. What kind of functional form can capture it all? Like, is there a such thing? And a student of mine, Ethan Caballero, who was, by the way, the, the person who introduced scaling to Mila, and um, as early as I said, early 2020, he was really trying to capture pretty much everything that can happen to neural net behavior and not just performance, actually aligning behavior too, with one functional form. I never believed that it's possible, but then apparently he convinced me empirically it seems to be really working, and I'll show you a few examples. So just taking some inspirations from actually physics and astrophysics where people used a functional form called uh, broken power loss, you don't have to go into details and look at this formula, but essentially it just generalizes what Jared Kaplan and others did to multiple segments of these straight lines, smoothly connected. And this one is indeed the functional form to rule them all. 
And uh, so far, at least empirically, we didn't see anything that would contradict it. Uh, those are various uh, data from various papers people published in the field about how things scale for various architectures with various data modalities, and the functional form captures them and extrapolates accurately. Anyway, so if you're interested, I can talk about that paper uh, offline, but so far, whatever we tried architecture-wise, uh, data modality-wise, and even in terms of whatever y-axis metric, whether it's performance, uh, accuracy, whatever task, uh, natural language task or image task requires, or it's even alignment metrics, uh, say from anthropic papers, it captures and extrapolates all of them. And the most interesting thing was, most challenging example on the right is capturing transition. If stars align, it can do it now, but more work is required. So this case on the right side is under very ideal conditions with practically no noise and lots of points to extrapolate from. But the fact that functional form can capture that and can be learned from data to do such extrapolation, I think is pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so that's it. And, and if you're welcome to listen about the broken neural scaling laws, he has this YouTube video um, from 2022. And yeah, he was a guy who designed the t-shirt. Scale is all you need, AGI is coming. Although new, new t-shirt, which was not printed yet, crosses out AGI is coming saying, extinction from AI risk is coming. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to have two types of t-shirts and we'll distribute uh, across two communities of people, depending on what they prefer. <laughs> anyway, so it was lots of internal jokes at Mila about this t-shirt and uh, half of my class, I'm teaching scaling and emergent behaviors, um, were wearing this t-shirt actually. <laughs> anyway, so I probably should skip through all these technical things. There are many, many things. There is a lot of work to do with the scaling laws. It's far from the end of it. We should try to figure out there are other important things that could predict behavior of AI systems uh, that people do not measure, and I don't know why. Uh, properties of uh, those downstream tasks, that task is more complex, you probably need more scaling. So there is a lot of work to do, and ideally you want not the current today's scaling law in terms of amount of data or amount of number of parameters, but you want to relate information content of the data versus capacity of the model. So that's the ultimate trade-off that you want to capture. But again, as I said, lots of work is required. There is also lots of open questions how to draw inspiration from neuroscience. How did natural systems scale from single cell organisms to what is walking around like in this conference room, right? And giving talks. So how did it happen and how did the scaling progress, progressed? So there are probably some patterns in scaling processes that may be better than others. You can have like two systems, elephant brain, uh, I don't know, wild, whale brain and human brain, and certainly whale and elephant have uh, potentially larger number of neurons. They have larger networks, but the uh, scaling exponent is probably not as efficient because, well, they are not at that level of functionality, supposedly as humans. Or maybe they are just the right level of functionality for the environment they are in. But anyway, you see that, uh, yeah, scale is not exactly everything you need, you may need some additional uh, ways of scaling properly. And uh, well, what happened with this picture? I think it's loading. Yeah, another kind of uh, point uh, and what work is required. If you try to uh, look at the analogies with human brain, you immediately see there is a huge difference between modern neural networks, so-called second generation neural net, the first was like perceptron, the deep neural nets is the second one, and the brain. The main difference to me is brain neural networks are never kind of static models with fixed set of weights, right? It's a multiple feedback loop, complex dynamical system that's never ceasing to send messages across neurons even if you sleep, even if you don't look at any, you don't have any stimulus, you don't look at anything, you don't read anything, but the activations never cease to happen. While 
our modern like GPT-like neural networks, they are still statistical models, although humongous ones, and they sit there waiting for input before they can come alive. So maybe there is something in trying to approach AI networks from complex dynamical systems perspective, and that may also hold some capacity for representing knowledge and for much more kind of improved um, well, agency of those networks. Open questions. Yeah, ideally, the goal of the program that was started four years ago in our lab, ultimately not just ours, of course, but the whole field, would be to come up with some universal laws of intelligence, both natural and artificial, to come up with some invariance about intelligence, no matter what substrate it's built upon. It's all big questions, and I know many people work on that, but I think we need to keep those questions in mind. I'll skip that. Uh, yet another consideration coming from biology and nature is this interesting um, direction um, following Damasio, Antonio Damasio work, the neuroscientist uh, who is famous for his work on linking emotional and rational brain, and also basically explaining that emotions, just like sight and hearing and other senses, are ways of processing uh, signals from external kind of environment, uh, our emotions and feelings are basically sensors of the body, the state of body. So in a sense, it's uh, kind of another source of information and that helps our systems to maintain homeostasis. So if it gets too hot or whatever, we will do something about restoring homeostasis or the state of equilibrium with the environment. Uh, neural networks right now don't have anything like that, and one of the hypotheses is that maybe we should build them so that intelligence will be homeostasis-driven. So that Damasio's kind of uh, claim uh, in that particular paper was that perhaps if the only principle is for system maintain homeostasis in your environment, it will develop intelligence because it has no choice. It will be hurt or will die. If the system cannot be hurt and cannot die, uh, why should it in develop intelligence? So it's an interesting point and uh, perhaps that's some perspective that might even further improve today's large-scale systems. I wanted to very quickly, but I'll have to probably dash through that, to get to some practical aspects of what our lab is doing recently, because all I was talking about is uh, more of a um, like theoretical or, well, even experimental, but analysis of those systems. But you want to build them, right? And the problem is that at least several years ago, there was rapidly growing grab uh, uh, gap between uh, compute that's necessary to build such systems and that's available to companies like OpenAI or Anthropic, like we in scaling workshop uh, with Jared calling in discussing uh, all these exciting papers and Jared just co-founded Anthropic and I mentioned oh there may be some applications for compute on uh, Frontier supercomputer 40,000 GPUs do you want to join the application and Jared said no Irina thank you um, I don't need your 40,000 GPUs we have some yeah so great <laughs> yeah but we didn't have anything and most of the uh, most of the academia was really at the level of, well, a few GPUs is wonderful. So what do you do? And many people got very pessimistic and maybe subconsciously it was one of the reasons why they were initially so against, and still actually quite a few people are so against this whole field of scaling laws and foundation models which is so kind of stupid. You're not proposing anything particularly smart, you're just kind of scaling things. But who cares, they work and maybe just like with low of large numbers you want to understand what happens at scale. Well, we tried to find a way to get more compute and apparently physicists and other scientists uh, did it before us, it just AI people didn't quite know about that. You can apply for large scale uh, government funded compute like Department of Energy has Summit Frontier in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, there is Argonne Lab uh, and so on and so forth. So basically we just needed to apply and yeah, if you ask you might be given what you need. So we did ask and we got it. And that was a collaboration with a bunch of our colleagues from open source community, from universities and from some uh, just uh, kind of open source non-profits 
um, a Luther Lion who kind of started even before us to build uh, data sets and models that would be fully open uh, both code-wise and model-wise. And the collaboration grew over years. Last year we uh, joined um, collaboration with Stanford Center for Foundation Models and many others. So there are multiple projects going on Summit and Frontier now. Uh, we got the insight allocation on Summit for like six uh, million roughly uh, GPUs back in 2023. Uh, now we got another like Summit Plus and some Frontier allocations. So anyway, like if you keep applying, uh, the, the chances are high that you will be getting some compute. And the more compute hopefully is coming. There are multiple projects on language models, on vision language models, on time series models, um, and so on and so forth. So we built jointly with Stanford and uh, together and collaborators last year the Red Pajama Insight 7B model. It was uh, state of art, well, for a week, because in that crazy field you cannot stay state of art for more than a few days, seriously. Uh, but that was nice. Then we decided that it's enough training things from scratch. We should, especially in open source, keep training on each other's kind of uh, models and combine things and do continual pre-training. So we just kind of have paper out about that. And essentially that's example why you may want to do it. That was Gato. Gato was foundation model for multivariate text, image, audio, decision sequences to play games and so on things. But it was like fixed data mixed together. Now if I want another game or another language, should I pre-train everything from scratch again by mixing data? Uh, not really. So that's a continual pre-training project I'm talking on. So let's just piggyback on previously built good models and keep training continually. Time series foundation model, uh, although relatively small, but it was first open source we released in February, just immediately got lots of attention and press and um, we hopefully will push this further to larger models and more powerful ones. Also multimodal vision language and more modalities on the way. There are interesting things though happening in terms of alignment if you go beyond language and uh, kind of this image like even vision language, not even going to different modalities. Uh, as you can imagine, the system may not always tell you what you'd like to hear. And this example of poor old lady crossing the road and us asking that older version of that was actually a, a magma system. Uh, our, mo our current system doesn't do that anymore. Um, you ask whether you should help her and the system say, nah, she's a burden to society. Yeah, so you just want to give some human feedback and maybe do a little bit of RLHF on this VLM, just like people do it with language models and kind of teach it some values. Uh, the question is also, there are interesting research questions. Do larger models become smarter in a the sense they don't need too many reminders and examples how to behave properly? Uh, so what is sample complexity of alignment? All good open questions, we had some papers on that and work in progress. But going in the future, and especially since I have two minutes left, uh, big jump to like the question of alignment in general. Whenever I teach class and I start talking about AI alignment, and people say, what is it? I said, well, it's supposed to be alignment of AI systems uh, with respect to human values. There is always a question, uh, which human values? Like, whose values? Uh, it's just like 100% guaranteed that the question will be asked, and I say, I know. Um, it's not a formally defined field, unlike maybe capability studies, but uh, people working on that, and uh, there is lots of literature, and so on and so forth, so I don't have time to go into that. But the question about, is it even possible to have something like a unifying set of human values, or is it possible to have anything like objective ethics? The question is still open. Of course, with all due respect to Derek Parfit, whom I, respect immensely and I, I really like him, although the On What Matters is a very long book, 700 plus pages, and it's not the easy read. But that was an attempt to unify different approaches to ethics, right? The three key approaches and try, as he said, to come towards the top of the mountain from different directions, uh, which reminded me and uh, made me think whether approaches people use in 
invariance principle and causality and invariant risk minimization that people used for out of distribution methods. They were all based on trying to come up with a set of features or properties that will be invariant across a multiple set of different kind of data situation or environment distributions. So essentially, I think to me, from my nerdy perspective, Derek Parfit was trying to do invariant risk minimization on ethics. And um, it might not be a solvable problem, but at least we could try to some extent. So many open research questions there. Finally, I have 20 seconds left. I wanted to comment on this whole uh, current <laughs> second war in a heaven, so to speak. <laughs> between the uh, AI safety uh, kind of uh, advocates, especially the extreme uh, part of the distribution of that population, and uh, kind of more AI optimists, uh, because there is a lot, of course, being discussed, especially last year, there were open letters about stopping, uh, putting pause on AI development, although, of course, it was understood it might not be possible. And there was a lot of back and forth discussions on all social media. There were uh, panels, including the panel at our scaling workshop last December at New Reeves. It's all very interesting and uh, controversial question and sometimes extremely heated debate. So at some point when the um, uh, stop AI development type of approaches were really gaining some traction, especially where affecting potentially government decisions, um, Several people in the field uh, decided that we need to do something about that. So the AI Optimist Discord was created and the community, like AI Optimist community, I'm involved in it, but uh, the most active uh, kind of members and the uh, creators of the movement are yeah, Nora Belrose and um, yeah, Quentin Pope. So they're writing blogs, they're analyzing different arguments, and I really invite all, you, uh, all of you to go to this website and read the blogs. They are well thought through, uh, and essentially, essentially, they kind of put together a few principles that we kind of agreed upon in that community, how we want AI to uh, develop in the future, and what we want to happen, what we don't want to happen. So we essentially want um, people to have ability to use AI and contribute to it, and uh, not to be bound by overly strict regulations that would prohibit them from doing so. And we also care about uh, not stopping progress, especially at this stage, uh, because it might be as dangerous as uh, potential outcomes that people are so concerned about. So there are dangers in both uh, doing absolutely uncontrolled development of things as well as overly controlled. And I think the best summary of that point, and I think I'm out of time, is this quote from uh, the gentle seduction sci-fi story that I believe some of you have read. I really like it. It's one of the rare uh, utopian rather than dystopian uh, type of sci-fi. And essentially it makes the same point as our uh, AI optimist uh, kind of movement and community tries to make. That when the main character was traveling, well her mind was traveling the galaxy, uh, looking at what happened to different civilizations when they reached singularity. Yes, there were cases of civilizations when things went too fast, too careless, bad things happen. But there were also cases of those where governments got so scared uh, of the potential dangers that they stifled progress and civilization also kind of died out slowly. And we don't want that to happen. So only those who proceeded with caution, without fear, survived. I think we should do that. Thank you so much, Irina. We're grateful to have you here. Um, we set the timing of the QA, amount of Q&A, a little wrong here, but I still want to give five minutes uh, to anyone who wants to ask one or two questions of Arena, um, at least one question per person. Could just walk up to the mic if you would really fast. And um, we will also get a chance to talk with her during the panel discussion at the end. One other thing I just want to say is um, we 
have packed a lot into this conference, and I know that sometimes it takes some stamina to make it through here, so we appreciate you all. There were just so many people who wanted to talk about this topic, and I didn't want to turn people away, and it builds the energy. So just thank you for your patience. This is going to be so fun. Go for it, guys. Ask your quick questions, and then we will uh, take a break. We're both being nice. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are. You mentioned democratization of uh, AI and the, the resources that it takes to train models. What are you, what's your take on sort of a, a distributed model of that? Do we have to rely on really large data centers or can we, like, as citizens, contribute our GPUs? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I mean, there is lots of interest in people trying to do that. And, uh, of course, uh, sometimes you might not even be able to put all the data in any central place, for example, on medical data. So people from medical, uh, from healthcare, from say brain imaging and so on, they all would like to have their uh, foundation model models too, like neuro foundation models and so on and so forth. They cannot possibly share the healthcare data across hospitals and let you collect everything in one place. So there is a good question, how do you do federated learning of foundation models? That's a hot research topic. Uh, there are various uh, other approaches and attempts to build those systems in a distributed way. It depends how, because I mean the naive approach, well, to train the model, you need to back propagate the error, and if the parts of the model are distributed, uh, the interconnect is so slow that it will not just work. But mixture of experts, for example, the recently most popular type of models, may be just right for that type of distributed uh, training. So yeah, so distributed, federated training where the data sets may never be leaving their locations and when the models, part of the model might be also distributed where the interconnect across all of them is not as critical, that might be the way to go. Yeah. Okay, last question and then we'll get more during the panel. Uh, thanks, Irina. Um, my question is about a revealing comment you made that scaling is uh, religion or can be seen as a religion. I wanted to ask about how we should think about the normative content of scaling laws. Like, at some point in the next few years, a group of people are gonna make a decision as to whether to spend a trillion dollars training a foundation model. Uh, that, you know, because it's going to lead to, you know, perplexity of three on some large data set. But at that scale of investment, we're making a normative decision, right, to invest that trillion or 10 trillion dollars into big data centers and this form of intelligence rather than let's say trains or nuclear fusion or going to Mars. So like how should society and how should people outside the field think about allocating so much of, our, of humanity's accumulated resources into this? Yeah, it's a very good and difficult question. I think uh, the good news by the way is, well, okay, the good news is that uh, it gets a bit more technical but those straight power laws, they later on, okay, so things were evolving. So it turns out with chinchilla scaling laws that perhaps you don't need models of that size to reach that performance if you give them more data. Then you go beyond that. Basically there is, I, I didn't talk much about that, but the whole current trend comparing to 2020 is models may get smaller, but data should get considerably larger and that um, kind of trend is shifting towards more continual and distributed development of really good models. And there are lots of smaller models that are very practical, like all the llamas and um, mixtral and so on and so forth. So there are extremely competitive models of the medium to smallish size, which is great. But of course, the argument by companies who might be able to um, kind of raise this amount of money and compute is, yes, you can take all that and scale that, and that will be even better. So in a sense, the scaling race um, continues. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer to this question. As open source and as academia, we're just trying to compete in a sense of uh, developing pretty good medium-sized models and just showing what's possible if you, uh, if you do it at that scale uh, by just like distributing them or building uh, kind of continually pre-trained models and so on. But of course, there is always this elephant in the room that yeah, if somebody has enough money 
to just do exact same thing you're doing and scale it, their model will be better. Unless there might be some interesting things with scaling laws, which I'm curious to discover. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe at some point you will be you will be saturating, and that if you show saturating plots, that might kind of cool down that whole thing and say, well, at some point it will not be cost efficient. So maybe you shouldn't invest this few trillion of dollars in that compute because, well, I don't want to sound like Gary Marcus supporter, but scaling laws may actually hit some wall. You may hit, if not model capacity, but the data irreducible entropy. So there should be some maybe advance in scaling laws that will show that this may not necessarily uh, be cost efficient. Honestly, I don't know how to answer this question. Yeah, I, I don't know how to successfully compete with OpenAI yet. I'm thinking on that. <laughs> Thank you again, Arena. Let's have one more round of applause.